All right, we are just outside the little bitty town of Helper, Utah, at the foot of the Book Cliffs. This is the Price River Canyon. In fact, the Price River is just down here behind me. But this is a great spot to stop and give a little bit of an overview of the Book Cliffs themselves and the Cretaceous sedimentary rocks that make them up. Our stop here is actually gonna be at what's called the Panther Tongue. If you're a sedimentary geologist, you've probably heard of it. If you work in deltas, you've definitely heard of it. If you're neither, you're about to hear about it. So the succession of rocks behind me is the classic book cliffs. It's the Black Hawk Formation of the Mesa Verde Group. Each of those sandstone bodies in the ridge has its own name. There's the Castle Gate up at the top. There's throughout the rest of it, the Kenilworth, the Sunny Side, um, the Aberdeen. There's the Panther Tongue at the base. A whole group of them. They all have their, like I say, individual names, and they can be tracked for tens of miles out into the basin, out towards Green River, Utah, and even into Colorado. They represent shore faces and deltas. So they represent coastlines that are prograding in the Cretaceous from the mountains in the west out into the basin to the east. So all that sediment was building, 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 and periodically the shorelines would retreat. So each of those sand bodies in the cliff represents building out and then retreating. And then another sand body built out and then retreated. So what you're seeing is an overall progradation of clastic material from the mountains. You're just filling in the western interior seaway with sediment. The Panther Tongue is the first of the major sand bodies at the base of that succession. It's a delta. It's a river-dominated delta. It's one of the best studied deltas on the planet because it's well exposed, it's right by the highway, and small enough that you can get a pretty good handle on it in all its aerial extent. Having said that, it's really only exposed along a very small area uh, two-dimensionally. It's hard to get a 3D read on the Panther Tongue. Substantial chunks of it we just don't know anything about. But it's very popular. So it's almost like the Kardashian of deltas. It's way overexposed. Too many people know way too much about it, but it's probably not something you wanna take home to your mom or use to build a reservoir model. And we'll talk a little bit about that on the outcrop. So I'm gonna drive up this road into Price River Canyon, leave Helper, and just a few miles up the road, we're gonna turn into what's called Genteel Wash. And we're gonna walk through the Panther Tongue Delta and show you what it's all about. Okay, so the joys of modern technology means that the video I shot here yesterday somehow didn't get preserved on my phone, but I am at the Panther Tongue in what's called Gentile Wash, one of the most famous outcrops in the Book Cliffs. Behind me is the delta front and mouth bar of the Panther Tongue, and I'm going to spin around and show you what it looks like on the other side of the canyon wall. It's a lot more covered and heterolithic, not as exceptionally inspiring. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the video, but I'm also gonna spin around and take a look across the highway. And that is the Panther Tongue there, right there. And you can see it's inclined to the east. So we're gonna go out and look at this section back up here where it's a lot more thickly bedded and a lot more amalgamated than just a few hundred feet, maybe a thousand feet away. It's deltaic, that plays into it. So let's go take a look at it up close and compare that to that to that. All right, I'll splice this in, you won't even notice. We're getting to the Pro Delta sediments of the Panther Tongue. Here they are, you can see the lamination in them. There's a fair amount of mud, silt, sand, pretty much what you expect in a Pro Delta, not heavily bioturbated. Unfortunately, there's a lot of talus, so we don't have to break off chunks of it to see what's in it. We can actually just take a look at some of the talus. So I'm going to grope through here, see if I find anything interesting. Otherwise, you can just kind of get a feel for it that's pretty well laminated, silty mud, all the way through until we start getting the sands on the mud. Everybody loves geology. Okay, so I found some chunks of stuff in the Pro Delta. Um, there's actually some fish scales in here which, you know, again, not unexpected. It's a, it's a marine environment, you expect fish die, um, but there's not a lot of burrowing. So we're gonna break this open further and see what else is in here. I don't know how well it's gonna show up on the screen here, but there's little things like phycosiphon maybe, 
um, and some teeny tiny, maybe shop cylindricness. These are basically things made by feeding and probing of worms. So little offshore tiny marine worms kind of poking and probing in the sediment with their schnozzles. Um, so far, it seems to be about all I'm finding in here. It's kind of fun. I keep finding these cannonball concretions in the Pro Delta. Um, a lot of people find stuff like this and think it's a dinosaur egg or something. Um, when I was a student at University of Wyoming, I used to volunteer at the Geological Museum. And about, you know, a couple times a summer, somebody would bring in something like this and say, I think I found a dinosaur egg. And you have to break it to them. Like, no, it's concretion. Nine times out of ten, they wouldn't agree with you or believe you anyway. So, well, I know it's a dinosaur egg. Geologist tracks. Usually, if you come here in the summer, this place is crawling with geology students and oil company geologists. This is where I used to take people on company field trips. As a matter of fact, this is where I'll be taking some students in a couple of days, along with company geologists or two. So it's still popular. I'm just surprised there's nobody here right now. I guess it's a little late in the day. This is a favorite spot of sedimentary geology professors to have sermons for their students. In fact, if you Google panther tongue, well, depending on what you're Googling and how you're Googling it, make sure you include geology, otherwise God knows what you'll find. But you'll probably find some version of this very face right here. It really is ideal for explaining how a delta works in subsurface and through processes. So you know, again, a delta is just where a river dumps a bunch of sediment into a standing body of water. That's it, it's very simple. As that delta builds out, it's filling into a basin, meaning it prograds. So every new flush of sediment builds it out a little bit further, a little bit further. It's not only building out, it's also building up. That means that what starts off distal eventually gets overridden by proximal stuff. So by going vertical, you're actually seeing what was lateral, all right? Just think about that for a second. It's called Walther's Law. What that means is the stuff at the top of the panther tongue, if you followed it out during the Cretaceous far enough and long enough, it would bottom out into the material that looks like the stuff at the bottom of the panther tongue. So deltas in cross-section have these kind of S-shapes called cliniforms or forsets. And when you're thinking in terms of subsurface, Again, either hydrocarbon or groundwater or carbon storage and utilization. You got to start thinking in terms of those bodies as being connected all the way through the reservoir, but with unique geometries. And of course, you can have faults and stuff moving through them. So going from bottom to top in a delta succession like the panther tongue is the equivalent of going from distal to proximal. So going from oceanward to landward. So we're going to do that here. We're going to start at the deepest part of the delta and work our way shallowest to the land and see what kind of sediments and faces we have, see what kind of trace fossils we have, and put together a story for how the panther tongue evolved. So probably the first thing that strikes you looking at this outcrop is that the lower part is strongly bimodal in terms of grain size or parent grain size, or certainly texture. So there's the resistant beds, which you might guess are sandstone, and you'd be right. There's the recessive beds, which you might guess are like silty mud. You'd be right again. The upper part of the outcrop is pretty homogeneously sand. So there's a fundamental change. Now, I showed you something similar to this when I looked at the Farron Deltas further to the east. I did a video walking from bottom to top of those. I did something similar with the Frontier Delta in Wyoming. All deltas kind of have the same motif of a ratty heterolithic base with sand, mud, sand, mud, sand, mud, and a cleaner, sandy upper surface, upper part. That's the mouth bar dominated. If you were to pick up a chunk of one of these sands, which again is nice because you don't have to break uh, these little chunks of talus all around, you'd see on its surface, ooh, look at that. Look at that, there's thalassinoides. That's those T-shaped and U-shaped and Y-shaped horizontal burrows that have enlarged nodules where they meet. Those are made by shrimp, acid shrimp. They're also made by a variety of worms and things, but shrimp are the most common makers of them. So my finger is on a really good thalassinoides right there. You can see the T-shaped junctions, kind of swollen nodes where they meet. And I'm fairly confident the shrimp that made them because in these rocks, we're also gonna see some Ophiomorpha. Ophiomorpha and thalassinoides are made by the same animals, just different substrates where it's incohesive, not cohesive sediment. They make Ophiomorpha because they need to hold together the sediment with their pellets. Where it's more cohesive, they can make thalassinoides. 
So we're gonna walk through some of these beds, see what we see in them, and then work our way up to the coarse grain material, the massive sand at the top. So here's the first of the thicker sand bodies in this lower delta front. It's about I don't know, 10, 11 inches thick, so maybe 20 centimeters or so. Looking at the sedimentary structures, it's pretty striking. First thing you notice is the base is scoured and there's a bunch of burrow casts in the base. So there's a whole lot of stuff that was living down there before the sand came in and filled it in. Then it's massive. There's not really any sedimentary structures in here. It's just sort of structural with sand. Followed by a little bit of planar to maybe ripple laminated sand. Then planar laminated silty sand. Then mudstone or what we're calling mudstone, what almost everybody calls mudstone. It's actually pretty silty. Let's just call it mud anyway, just because that's what everybody else calls it. No, that's wrong. Let's call it silty mudstone. So the succession we have in this bed is strongly reminiscent of what's called a Bauma sequence. And I talked a little bit about them in a different video, looking at the Hatch Mesa mystery sands. But a Bauma sequence is typical of a turbidity flow named by uh, or for Arnold Bauma, who was an LSU professor, discovered this um, succession of deposits. Very common in sediment gravity flows, not traction flows, not suspension settling flows, but sediment gravity flows. In other words, avalanches, basically. So if you're watching an avalanche come down a mountain, you see it's got this kind of glide plane base, and then the denser snow and skiers and everything else is in the lower half of the avalanche. Then you see that kind of puffy cloudy material that settles out afterwards, after the thing, main avalanche flow is passed. Same deal here. So here's that glide plane, the cushion. Here's that massive sand and slurry of material. Then as it passes, the currents on top kind of allow the finer grain material to settle out and get reworked by the ensuing currents. And that's when you get the planar lamination, the ripples, the planar laminated silty muds, and then the silty mud cap on the top. So this is essentially a turbidite. It is a turbidite, but it's on a delta front. Turbidites are a process. They happen on mountains. They can happen in your coffee cup when you pour dense cream into a hot coffee. They happen in uh, all sorts of environments. They can happen in shallow water, like inches of, of water. They can happen in flumes. People make experiments in flumes with like a foot of water. It's a process. It's not related to water depth at all. But in the industry, at least, a lot of people got used to using the term turbidite and deep water synonymously. So each of these sand bodies is its own little turbidite succession with the fair weather sediment in between. We're going to look at some other parts of these turbidites and see some more characteristics of them because they're pretty interesting. The stuff that's underneath in the casts is pretty cool. I'll show you in a second. Fortunately, this outcrop is periodically dropping chunks of rock. So I don't have to go climbing up there to show you stuff underneath. It comes down to us. But look at these long, straight features in this rock. Those are tool marks or flute casts. The most reasonable interpretation of these is probably that they were formed by a fossil log. Well, a log at the time, just a regular log, um, getting dragged along the bottom. So if this is a river-dominated delta, which has been interpreted as, and, and I agree with, during rivers' uh, flood stages, they tend to dump a lot of trees and carcasses of animals, all kinds of things from the floodplain and the banks into the river, which then gets blasted out to the delta. So after a flood, if you go out to a delta, you find a lot of logs, a lot of trees, a lot of bodies of animals, and unfortunately people and houses and cars. So it makes sense that a log that got dumped in to the Panther Tongue River would have found its way out to the delta and eventually just kind of pushed along the bottom, got dragged along. Um, you know, it's certainly one interpretation. There's others, but I happen to think this looks a lot like a tree, so I'm sticking with that interpretation. Feel free to make your own. Okay, so we're looking at some more of these turbidite beds. Now we're starting to see some vertical burrows in them. Uh, these are probably things like scolithos or siphonychnus made by vertical burrowing worms and clams. There's also ophiomorpha. We're starting to see some ophio, some of the burrowing shrimp that make the pellet line burrows which feed into thalassinoides. Here's a small Ophiomorpha right here, as a matter of fact. Ooh, look at that. So we have shrimp burrows. We've got simple vertical, maybe worm burrows. Not a lot. It's not as bioturbated as, for example, the Farin Delta. I did a video of the Farin, and man, that thing is chewed to hell. There's a lot of burrowing there. Here, not so much. 
In fact, these beds are in pretty good shape and the material in between the beds is in pretty good shape. So the Farron Delta is probably wave influenced, wave dominated because there was not this discrete separation of sand, mud, sand, mud, uh, and everything was really burrowed up. Whereas here, it's not very burrowed at all. This is more common in a river dominated Delta because you have that outflux of terrestrial organic material, which marine organisms do not like. There's a lot of fresh water. There's a lot of uh, terrestrial muds and clays, which again, marine animals don't like. So it tends to preserve preservation and bedding a lot better than something like the Farron Delta, which looks like the waves are coming in and sweeping it up, cleaning it up, removing all the terrigenous material and infusing it with salt water. An absolutely textbook example of Ophiomorpha. You can see the little, what's been called corn cob texture. It really does look like a little corn cob. And this is from those turbidite beds. It was happily living in the post-turbidite successions, making its home, creating those little pellets to line the sandy burrows because the sand was not very cohesive. So it needs these pellets to reinforce its burrow. Um, here's another one down here. You see the Ophio down here. Here's one, they're just all over. Um, not completely chewed, but just like in the river dominated Trinity Bay head delta on the Texas coast where there's Ophiomorpha that can tolerate fresh water for significant periods of time, I think the same is probably true here in the Cretaceous. So the panther tongue probably had significant periods of freshwater, prolonged freshwater runoff, but the little Ophiomorpha shrimp can handle it because they burrow down deep enough that they can tap into that salt water. Uh, there's a reservoir of salt water because salt is more dense than fresh. So it tends to sink down into the sediment and by burrowing down, they can maintain salinity in their burrows. By the way, here's another great example of potential turbidite bedding. Look at this, it sits on top of this kind of burrowed bed. Then there's a sharp surface, scoured with massive, planar, maybe some slight rippling, planar, and then mud, silty mud. So just another turbidite succession. All the way through here, that's all these sand bodies are. I think you get the point. Not a lot of burrowing, a lot of turbidites, consistent with sediment gravity flows out of a mouth of a river. Let's take a look at the massive stuff in the, in the uh, mouth bar and see what we can discern from that. Here's a talus slope block from that upper, more massive looking mouth bar. And it's pretty telling. There's actually plant fragment stems in here. There's what looks like paleophycus burrows. Um, that mud line burrow that's a very simple horizontal burrow. This is a sand cast of one. So paleophycus, usually made by polychaete worms. Um, fragments of, like I said, plant material, maybe some shell material. But it looks like a real hodgepodge of stuff. It looks exactly like what you would expect to get washed in during a big flood when the river just kind of goes bleh and spits out all the plant stems and leaves and fragments. And some of the brackish water animals, like these polychaete worms, they like that kind of stuff. They might say, hey, all right, life is good. Um, and they might come in and kind of start messing around with it. So that's what the underside of these beds look like. Let's go take a look at the beds in cross section in that massive, more massive looking sand of the mouth bar. So this shows why you gotta be careful with what you call things. From down there, I'm calling it massive because it looks massive. Um, and you know, if you're talking generalities, that's probably okay. If you're talking specifics to like a reservoir model or a sedimentary geologist who's really anal about these kinds of things, they would correct you and say, well, it's actually not massive, it's laminated. And it is. It's strongly, strongly parallel laminated. That's interesting because there's no trough cross bedding in here that I'm seeing. There's no ripples, nothing like that. Just strongly parallel laminated sand which is consistent with upper flow regime. In other words, this current is really just ripping along, creating these plain beds of sand, shooting along, depositing sand bed after sand bed after sand bed as it stacks up. It's not creating ripples, not creating dunes, just shooting that sand out, building up a mouth bar. High velocity, small grain size. It just doesn't have big grains to work with. It's just got this fine grain sand and it's very fine to fine grain on the grain size chart. There's no medium, nothing coarser than that. No fossils, it's high energy. There's not a lot of burrowing organisms that would be happy living on this. Maybe after it's done being deposited, some might colonize the top and burrow into it. That happens in the modern Bayhead Delta on the Trinity. 
but not always. So, you know, it might get stripped away. That upper part might be stripped away by the next flow. And depending on how frequently these things were coming in, these organisms might not have had a chance to kind of colonize that upper surface. So it doesn't look like there's too terribly much in the way of burrowing. No bones either from animals. Um, not many plant fragments either. It's just pretty clean sand. So from a reservoir perspective, hey, it's great stuff. It's parallel laminated, clean, fine-grained sand. Not many baffles or barriers in here. From, a, uh, from an interesting point of view of a guy who's looking for trace fossils, there's something cool to say about it. Not much. So, you know, depends on your point of view how great and wonderful this stuff is. It's all pretty great and wonderful. You know, who am I kidding? So this is the mouth bar facies of the panther tongue. I'll just look around a little bit more, see if there's anything else, and that'll be that. All right, so apparently there are some trace fossils here. Not many of them, but there's a horizontal one, fairly straight. Um, you could call it planolites, except it's pretty big. It doesn't seem to have a mud lining like Paleophycus. So yeah, it's a horizontal trace. There's not many of them here. Um, whatever it was, there was not a lot of them. Probably some kind of polychaete worm cruising along. So just a final observation on this upper mouth bar facies. You know, the sands are sub-meter scale thick. The delta front turbidite sands were only about maybe 20 centimeters, 30 at the most. These guys are, you know, half a meter or a meter or more. Uh, between them is that hash of plant material, silty material, maybe some shells, um, crud. You can see behind me, it's just very repetitious all the way to the top. They thicken a little bit up there. Um, just to give you an idea of the variability laterally, I'm gonna look across the canyon, about 100 feet. And look at that, that's really different than what we just walked through. What we walked through has a really strongly bimodal um, motif to it. It's got massive looking sand at the top and heterolithic at the base. 100, 150 feet away, it's more heterolithic all the way throughout. We don't have those big, thick, thick, massive mouth bar sands at the top. Again, if you look at a modern delta, that makes a lot of sense because mouth bars are finite in size, you know, maybe a kilometer or two wide, maybe less. The panther tongue is interpreted as not being a very big delta. So mouth bars might have only been a couple of hundred feet wide, maybe a thousand feet wide. So we might be on the edge of this mouth bar and that's why it doesn't show up on the other side of the canyon. Interestingly, it doesn't show up behind us on the other side of the road either. So this mouth bar right in front of us, or right to my right here now, um, it seems pretty localized in this area. In terms of predictability, let's say you had a core or a well log through this particular outcrop, and somebody says to you, hey, now predict out in each direction, five miles, 10 miles. <laughs> You'd have a hard time predicting out a couple of hundred feet in that direction and maybe a thousand feet in that direction. You wouldn't be able to successfully predict this unless you kind of drew a limit to the mouth bar and said, well, it just doesn't go out that far. How far does it go? I don't know, not that far. So it's really tricky predicting in deltaic environments what's connected to what and what's going where. The good news about subsurface deltas as reservoirs is that a lot of times there's multiple scours within them, there's sand on sand contact, there's faults running through. Um, so a lot of times, even though they're stratigraphically compartmentalized with mouth bars and different ar architectural elements like delta fronts, pro deltas, mouth bars, there's tributary channels. But from a fluid flow connectivity standpoint, they're probably a lot better connected than from a stratigraphic point of view. So don't panic if you're a subsurface person working on deltas. Um, some people like to freak out and think, oh my God, nothing's gonna be connected. Well, that's not true. Stuff will be connected. Of course, it's going to depend a lot on the particulars of your system, the scale of your system, fluid viscosity, and all that. But don't be alarmed. If you don't deal with subsurface deltas, if you're just here because you're curious about the book clips and the panther tongue, forget everything I just said and concentrate on how cool the rocks are and the fact that it's mid-April and we still got snow on the ground. <laughs> What's going on with that? So this has been a really quick trip to the panther tongue. Um, lots of oil companies for decades have sent their geologists here. Lots of schools continue to send their students here. What I just walked you through is fundamentally the kind of information we share with these types of groups of people. So I hope you enjoyed it from the comfort of your home, your coffee shop, your car, your office, wherever you are. I'm going to go get some coffee now because it's been a long day and I'll catch you on the outcrop. 
stay tuned for more videos and thanks for watching.